In this bass lesson, you're going to learn how three incredible bass players approach writing their own bass lines. Hi, I'm Luke from Become a Bassist, and if you want to know how Paul McCartney of The Beatles, Flea of The Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Mike Dirnt of Green Day write a bass line over the exact same chord progression, then check this video out. Welcome to lesson 8 of bass lines from scratch. So far we've looked at a ton of different ways of thinking about bass lines, different ways of creating them, different formulas we can apply them, uh, apply to make them for ourselves. But in this lesson I want to do something a little bit different. We're going to take three bass lines written over the same progression and see how they compare and we'll also try and pick apart the reasons why they sound so different and the possible thought processes for why these bass players made the decisions that they did. All three bass lines in this lesson are basically over a 1-5-6-4 chord progression. And for the sake of this video and to make it as easy as possible to see and hear the differences, I've put everything into the same key, the key of G major. That means our chord progression is G major, D major, E minor, C major. Those are our chords. There are a couple of variations in the songs, but we'll deal with those as they come up. Right now though, let's just dive in to our first song. To begin, we'll be looking at the verses to the Red Hot Chili Peppers song, Under the Bridge. Now obviously Flea is the bass player, player for the Chili Peppers, and he's kind of known for these intense slap lines. But this song is very different, at least at the start. It's very subdued and actually quite sparse. The bass line in the verse sounds like this. We get one, two, three, four. Now the original is in E, but just to keep everything in the same key, I've just brought this up to the key of G. But let's go through it again real quick. One, two, three, four. If you haven't heard this song yet, I definitely, definitely recommend you go and check it out so you can hear how the bass line relates to the rest of the track. And that goes for all these songs, by the way. So let's look over this bass line a lot more closely. First, the big picture stuff. Now if you know the track, you'll know that the bass doesn't actually start seriously playing until about a minute and a half into the song. There's this big guitar intro, then two full verses, and then the bass really comes in at the next section. Now Flea made a choice here to leave the bass out for that whole time. Or maybe that choice was someone that made it for him. <laughs> but why would he do that? Why would that choice be made? The drums actually come in during the second verse, but Flea doesn't. Now I can't tell you for sure, but musically it makes total sense uh, to have this song be kind of one big build and to actually hold off from adding the bass in. In fact, if you look at the waveform on the whole track, you can see this big build start to unfold. It starts small and then each section gets noticeably bigger before the outro kind of tapers off. Now if the bass had been in from the very start, the effect wouldn't have been nearly as powerful because there wouldn't have been anywhere to go from there. And also, if you listen to what Chad, the drummer, is playing, when he comes in before Flea, he's just playing hi-hats and snare. There's no bass drum. The bass drum is only introduced at the same time as the bass. And when that happens, there's this huge lift in the song. Now, this is exactly what serving the song looks like. They're putting the music before their ego. Now, Flea, Flea is a monster player. He could have been playing some super slick lines for that first minute and a half, but he didn't because the song is better without any of that stuff there. One big thing that really sticks out to me is that Flea just doesn't play one of the chords. It's the E minor chord in the second bar of the phrase. We get the G and the D, and then after that, the guitar is actually playing the E minor chord, but Flea just kind of lets it go the first time around. Again, he's making the decision to not play here and let this be really, really sparse. The second time though, he does play the E minor. Three, four, E minor, down to the C. You can also notice how many notes are played on the off beats, the ands of the strong beats. So we get one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, and four, one, two, and three, four, one, and two, and three, four. But every two bars, we get that strong beat one. There's a decent amount of off beats, but it's still very grounded because we get that root on our strongest beat 
every two bars without fail. Now, if you listen to the track, you'll also notice that Chad and Flea are super tight on these rhythms. They're absolutely together. Kick drum and bass drum working in perfect unison. It's like they're one instrument. It's very, very cool. Next, let's take a look at Paul McCartney's line in the verses of the Beatles classic, Let It Be. Now, this one was originally in the key of C, but once again, to keep everything easy to compare, I've shifted it up to the key of G. Now, this is where, uh, this is... Uh, actually what he plays in the last verse, because that's the only one where he's playing uh, bass for the whole thing. All the others he either doesn't play or he comes in halfway through the verse. But it sounds like this. We get one, two, three, four. Two, three, four. like that. It's the exact same chord progression, the G, D, E minor, C, uh, with a little bit of variation at the end of every phrase. Instead of going up to the C, uh, sorry, up to the E minor and then back to the C, it just goes straight to the C and then it kind of walks down with the, down to the G with uh, that little walk down there. Uh, the, or really we played it up here. Up there. Sweet. So how is this different from the last example and what can we learn from it? Well, the first thing that strikes me is that range-wise, this bass line is kind of high. Now, I have changed the key. I've brought it up uh, to, so it's easy to compare. But even in the original recording, Paul hardly ever goes below the root, this C right here. Even though the roots of all the other chords can be played below this C in a lower register than this C. This means that even when the uh, intensity in the track rises, it's still pretty light and never gets really too bogged down. It makes sense as well, there's a ton of extra stuff in this track. On top of all the core instruments, there's also an extra organ, extra backup singers, plus a bunch of extra uh, orchestration. By keeping the range a little bit higher, uh, everything stays clear and Paul avoids any of the muddiness that could have happened if he started kind of using that really low register of his bass. The next thing I notice about this is how kind of improvisational it is. Definitely more, at least, than the first Flea example. We've got this pentatonic line uh, at the, the end of the first phrase that leads into the second one. We've got a different one at the end which leads into the chorus section. Uh, this line is much busier than our first one and we get a lot of these kind of walk-ups and walk-downs. We get one in the kind of second bar here where we go... Yeah, we get a walk-up in the fifth bar. Pardon me. We also get one in the, the sixth bar again. Yeah, and then of course we get the uh, that same walk down uh, at both ends of the phrase. So the fourth bar and also the eighth bar. These are the exact kind of melodic devices, by the way, that we talked about in video seven of Bass Lines from Scratch. And you can see them being used here all the time. Now, we've talked about this line being a bit busier than the first example, but is it ever distracting? Does it take away from Paul's vocal at all? And to me, I'd say definitely not. In fact, the busiest parts of this line, the last bars of each phrase, you'll notice that Paul isn't even singing when he plays those 16th note runs. Check it out. We go... Silence. Da, 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 da. So, yeah, we've got this little fill perfectly placed in the gap where there were no vocals. By the way, this is a good habit to get into, making sure that if you ever do decide to get a bit fancy, that you pick your points wisely so you can have the most impact without taking anything away from the song. A very different approach in this track, but still a great, great bass line. All right, let's look at our final example. This one will be Mike Dirt playing on Green Day's when I come around. It'll sound something like this. One, two, three, four. Something like that. Now there are a couple of variations in the line, but that's the kind of basic idea. How is this though? This is easily the busiest bass line we've looked at so far. It averages roughly 12 notes per bar versus under the bridges 2 notes per bar. Let's think about why. To me, there are a couple of reasons. 
First of all, this is a much more high energy song than either of the other examples. And in general, the more high the energy, the more leeway you have to make a busier line. There's no big build or anything, it's straight into the action. Two bar guitar intro and just bam. Also, the instrumentation in Green Day is the kind of classic power trio. There's bass, there's guitar, and there's drums with vocals on top. There's nobody playing organ or adding a ton of instrumentation like in Let It Be, so there's a ton of kind of sonic space that's free to fill. The Chili Peppers from the first example have basically the same instrumentation, and when they play kind of higher energy songs, they fill a lot of that space as well. But can you imagine uh, this bass line? Could you imagine it being over under the bridge? Or even let it be? It just wouldn't work. It'd be kind of funny. It definitely wouldn't be uh, very musical, that's for sure. The next two things that stand out to me about this line are, again, the range and the sound. Mike makes a choice to play some things higher than he really needs to, but it's a good choice. For example, he could have played the line like this. Ah, oh, pardon me. everything down, well, some of the things down the octave, it would have been okay, but he didn't do this, and for a very good reason. Also, if you listen to the isolated bass track, you'll notice that the bass hasn't got a ton of low end. It's quite a light, quite a bright sound. And I think both of these things serve the same purpose. They allow the notes of the bass line to be clearly heard. If your sound is very bass heavy and you're playing in the low register, fast, nimble lines like this one, they just don't really work. They simply can't be heard properly. They can be felt, but not heard very well. Check it out. If I make my sound uh, a bit more darker and play down the octave, check out what it sounds like. Three, four. It's not great, right? You can't really tell what some of the actual notes are, especially if you added other instruments on top of that. But when Mike plays this in a higher register and where, where possible and uses less low end in his sound, every note comes out crystal clear. Now we've just talked a lot about the things that make these bass lines different. Some were busier, some used different kinds of sounds, used some different melodic devices, all that stuff. But what do they have in common? The big takeaway I want you to get out of this video is that each of these bass lines served the song that they were a part of. Each bass line outlined the chords by using roots. Not a crazy revolutionary idea, it's a simple concept, but each bass line executed it really well. Each bass line was aware of its place within the bigger picture of the song. They were sparse when they needed to be sparse, and they were busy when they needed to be busy. And they never took anything away from the song as a whole. If you can do these three things in your own bass lines, you have already won. If you make your own bass lines though, and you're not sure if they're any good or not, I have the perfect thing for you. It's called the Bass Lines From Scratch Checklist. Just quiz yourself about your bass lines, and if you can get them through most of the questions with a yes, then chances are your bass line is really strong. To get it, just click the first link in the description of this video, fill out the form on that site, and I'll send it straight to you 100% free. To recap though, we looked at three great bass lines all using the same exact chord progression. We looked at the Chili Peppers Under the Bridge, the Beatles Let It Be, and Green Day's When I Come Around. Of course we talked about all the things that were different, but most importantly, we talked about the elements that all the bass lines shared. Things like outlining the chords, being aware of the bass lines place in the song, and never distracting or taking away from the song. Now, thank you so much for checking out this video. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed making this one for sure. So make sure and download that uh, Bass Lines From Scratch checklist so you can make all your bass lines for yourself and make them so you can be proud of them. Uh, I'm sure it'll be super useful for you. I'm Luke from Become A Bassist and I'll see you in another video soon. Cheers. Yeah.